Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to take a look at the Analog Pocket. Now this little device has gotten a lot of media coverage over the past couple of years and I finally got my hands on one myself. And the main appeal of the Analog Pocket is that it can play all of your old cartridges. And that includes the original Game Boy, Game Boy Color, as well as the Game Boy Advance. Now Analog tries to make it very clear in their marketing materials that this is not software emulation, this is hardware emulation. So what they've done is they've used a technology called Field Programmable Gate Array in order to replicate the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance environment at the hardware level. Now we won't spend too much time talking about the difference between FPGA and emulation, but I do want to make that distinction here up front. Because at the end of the day, this is what Analog is kind of banking on. The idea here is that as you play these Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games, it's going to be exactly like the original hardware, but better. So you can expect things like low latency and really crisp audio, but then they've also made some hefty upgrades to the screen resolution as well as some of the menu options too. And thanks to some help from the community, there are now ways to sideload Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. And also in this video, I'll show you how to use a flash cart for Game Boy Advance. And so my goal in this video is to show you all the things this can do and then help you decide whether or not this warrants its pretty hefty price tag. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, to start, let's talk about the analog pocket in terms of technical specifications. Number one, this has two different chips within it. They are both Altera Cyclone FPGAs. One of them is currently used to mimic the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance hardware environment. And then that second FPGA is used for developers to unlock future cores. Now to date, there have not been any extra cores added to this device yet, but the idea here is that you would be able to potentially play other systems on it. Now, one of the main draws of the analog pocket is its display. It's only three and a half inches, but it has a 10 by nine aspect ratio, just like the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Now this features a low temperature polysilicon or LTPS LCD display. It's a somewhat newer technology, but basically it allows you to have greater pixel density. And that's how they're able to fit 1600 by 1440 pixels within this small display. For those of you who are doing the math, that is exactly 10 times the resolution of the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. And what that means, with a super dense pixel count like that, it's going to do beautiful scaling for both Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. It has a 4300 milliamp hour battery, which gives you about six hours of gameplay altogether. And it can support up to an 18 watt fast charge, which will charge in about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. In terms of connectivity, we have a three and a half millimeter headphone jack, as well as the original Game Boy Link cable if you wanted to trade Pokemon with a buddy. And then it also has a micro SD slot, as well as a USB-C port for both charging and docking. Out of the box, this can support Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance cartridges, but you can buy additional cartridge adapters, which will allow you to play Game Gear, Neo Geo Pocket, Neo Geo Pocket Color, and Atari Lynx. Now, each of those adapters are $30. And so that brings up the next topic I want to talk about, which is the price. The device first went on sale back in December of last year, and I ordered mine in the first 10 minutes that the sale was live. But even then, I wasn't able to make it into that first group. I was actually pushed into quarter four of 2022. And so my unit actually has not shipped yet. But luckily, somebody contacted me and said they were in that first shipment, and they ended up thinking that they weren't going to keep it. And so they ended up selling it to me at cost. And so that's how I was able to get my hands on one a little bit early. Now in terms of my review unit, I just kind of went all in. So I bought both the analog pocket as well as the dock, which is $100, and then also a screen protector and then the USB-C fast charger as well. In the end, I don't really think the charging brick or the screen protector is actually required. The device itself is actually covered in Gorilla Glass. And as far as the dock, you know, I'm kind of torn on that. I'm not really sure it's worth $100 to plug Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games into a TV, but the option remains there. Either way, at the end of the day, me buying this analog pocket plus those three accessories plus tax and shipping ended up costing about $430 altogether. Now, if you were to just buy the analog pocket plus shipping and taxes, you're looking at somewhere between $250 and maybe $300 depending on where you live. Either way, this is not a cheap device. And so I'm just kind of looking at it as about $250 altogether. And I gotta say, when it comes to the price, that definitely colors my review here today. As somebody who spends a lot of time in the handheld emulation community, this just seems like a very high price to only be able to play about three systems. 
Now, of course, I completely understand the difference between FPGA and software emulation, but one of the most important things for me in this review here is to see whether or not that price difference is actually warranted when it comes to the actual gameplay. Now, regardless of the whole FPGA versus emulation thing, I will say that the unboxing experience does feel nice and premium. The packaging is pretty nice, you know, it comes with just a single USB-C cable, but the presentation itself is pretty impressive. And so first impressions here, this thing is very balanced and hefty feeling. It's a little bit weird that the back here is completely straight, but it has enough roundedness to the sides that it does make it comfortable to hold. Now compare that to something like the Ambernic RG351V. This one is a little bit more rounded, but as you can see, it also has some contour to it as well. We'll show a little bit more of that device off later in the video. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any actual Game Boys to compare this to, but this does feel a little bit taller than I was expecting. A lot of that probably has to do with the aspect ratio of the screen. That 10 by 9 does make it pretty tall. Let's check out what we have in terms of I.O. On the left side here, we have the volume up and down buttons, as well as the sleep and power power button. We also have one of the two stereo speakers. On the right side we have the other stereo speaker and then the micro SD card slot. On the bottom we have that Game Boy Link port as well as the USB-C port and then two indicator lights here and that and that three and a half millimeter headphone jack. The back has a very simple aesthetic to it, but as you can see, there is a cartridge slot here for the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance cartridges, as well as shoulder buttons for Game Boy Advance games. Other than that, there's really nothing else on the back. But yeah, this thing feels super solid and hefty. I really like the feel of it. Now it's covered with a large piece of Gorilla Glass. As you can see here, it is very impressive looking. The bezels are pretty big, but all the same, I do like this look. To me, it feels like a glass that wouldn't easily break. Controls are very simple. We have a D-pad, A, B, and X, Y buttons, a select and start button, and then the analog menu button here in the bottom center. Okay, let's have a look at the controls and see how this feels in the hand. We'll start with the D-pad first. Now this is clearly a retro style D-pad. It has a rubber membrane connection and it has a good amount of travel to it as well. It's a little bit slick in the fact that it doesn't have any contours to it, but it is flared up a little bit at the edges here and I would say the travel here is just about perfect. It has a very slight pivot to it here in the center, which I think is going to make it really good to prevent accidental diagonals. And so to me, it looks like Analog spent a lot of time getting this D-pad right, and I do think they nailed it. Now on the right, we have our A, B, and X, Y buttons. Of course, the Game Boy and the Game Boy Advance did not use four-button setup, but hopefully as new cores get added to this handheld system, things like Super Nintendo might be possible. The buttons themselves feel really nice. They have a rubber membrane connection as well, and they do have a pretty good amount of travel too. They press down easily and bounce up quickly as well. They're nice and responsive. Now the top two buttons, the X, Y buttons here on the left and top, they're actually concave here in the center, a little bit like the Super Nintendo controller was. But then the A and B buttons are actually convex, so they are actually rounded a little bit at the top. And so you do have a bit of a contrast here, and I think that will come in handy when you have systems that can play with four face buttons. Now one thing I'd like to note is that the plastic on this device is a little bit grippy. I have a hard time describing it, but I would say it's almost paper-like in its feel. It has a matte kind of rough texture to it. The buttons in the D-pad do not share that same texture. They're a little bit more slick. In fact, I kind of wish that they had that same texture. I think they'd be easier to push down on. Either way, the device itself feels really good in the hands. Now on the bottom, we have our select start and analog button. These are all very clicky buttons and kind of small, but no complaints here. You're not really going to press those buttons very often anyway. Now in terms of ergonomics and balance, this does feel pretty good. A lot of that has to do with that heftier screen up top, but like with any other vertical handheld, there's not enough space to comfortably spread out all of your fingers. And so naturally you may want to interlace your fingers to be able to get a better grip. Another way you could do it is just kind of ball your hands into fists like I'm doing here. So that way the knuckles are touching each other. But we'll talk about that more when we actually start playing some games. For now, let's turn on the device itself and have a look at the menu interface. It does take a moment to boot up, but it's not terribly bad. And the menu itself is very bare bones. You can either play a cartridge or you can access some save states if you have them, or you can enter into the two bottom menus below. The first one is tools and you have two options here, Nano Loop and GB Studio. Nano Loop is a music creation tool. We're not really gonna get into that here in this video. And GB Studio is a game development platform which will allow you to play your creations right here on the device. And that's gonna come in handy here later in this video. So we'll check back on that here in a minute. Now, additionally, within the settings menu, you do have some different options. You can choose your system and then adjust things like the video options as well as audio or the controls. 
And each of these settings are going to be different depending on the system you choose. For example, if you go into Game Boy, you'll be able to choose between things like the original Game Boy DMG palette or something like the Game Boy Pocket or Game Boy Light. Or there's also an analog setting which will allow you to use different color palettes and things like that. So let's actually start popping in some games and testing them out. We're going to start with Game Boy Advance. Now, one of the things about these cartridges I'd heard is that some of them will be a little bit loose in the case. Now, luckily, Game Boy Advance doesn't have that problem. It is nice and snug within that case. It's not going to show you any of the boot logos because they do not have that original BIOS file within the device. But you will be able to access things like your original save files that are on the cartridge itself. Now the first thing that struck me about having a cartridge inside is that it severely limits your ability to use the shoulder buttons. In fact, you can only really put basically the tip of your index fingers resting on top of the shoulder button section here. And what that means is when you're actually playing, you have to kind of hold it with a claw grip like this. And unfortunately, this is not a very comfortable setup. In fact, I didn't really enjoy it at all like this. And so I kind of was stuck in this middle ground where I I had to use the shoulder buttons for games like F-Zero like this, but it wasn't very comfortable. And unfortunately that left me a little bit disappointed. I thought for this price that I should have perfect control. Now it's not all gloom and doom. In fact, this is a very comfortable device to hold. The thickness in particular is about an inch and it feels just perfect to hold in the hands. I don't know how they did it, but they absolutely nailed the thickness altogether. In reality, everything is great except for those shoulder buttons up top. It just doesn't have enough space. In fact, I found myself just kind of balling my grips instead, so that way I just didn't press those shoulder buttons at all. And of course, that's going to limit some of your gameplay. For example, with F-Zero, you do need those shoulder buttons. But altogether, it actually still felt more comfortable. Now, those settings that we looked at earlier, you can actually access them while the game is running. And so as you can see here, I'm going into settings and then video, and then I can actually mess around with the settings here. And each of these will vary by system. As you can see with Game Boy Advance, you have three different display modes to choose from. And I think that each person and will probably find an individual setting that works for them best, and I appreciate the fact that they have those options. Now to close out of game, all you have to do is quit out of it, and then at that point you can actually just swap out the cartridges without turning the device off. Now when putting in Game Boy cartridges, I did feel a little bit of that wobble that other reviewers were talking about. And so I think that if you are going to use Game Boy and Game Boy Color cartridges, you do need to be a little bit delicate with the cartridge itself so that it doesn't jostle and maybe you lose your game. And so starting up a Game Boy game here, it actually looks really great here. Part of that has to be the fact that it actually fills out the entire screen, unlike Game Boy Advance, which had some significant letterboxing. Now, same thing here. I'm going to go into the video settings and kind of mess around with some of the options here. Each of them have their own kind of distinct look to them, but I ended up actually using the DMG one after kind of going through this whole review process. But the analog one is pretty cool because you can use different color palettes, and so you do get a bi-color kind of look. The options are not going to be as robust as something like a software emulator, but all the same, you do have some pretty good choice here. And admittedly, maybe it's because I just don't have a Game Boy or a Game Boy Advance to play with, it is kind of thrilling to be able to take these original cartridges and play them just like you could back in the day. But of course, this is greatly improved with much better pixel resolution, a backlit display, as well as a much longer battery life. And same goes with Game Boy Color. In fact, this is some of my favorite games to play because yes, they fill out the entire screen, but then the colors themselves are nice and vibrant and you do have some options with saturation and things like that too. Now, one thing that I did find surprising is that many of my game cartridges actually would not boot on the analog pocket. Now, granted, I have some very old and busted up cartridges, but still some of these actually will play on other systems. For example, I have a cartridge reader and each of these were able to read the cartridge. But here on the analog pocket, I had more games that that didn't work than those that did. And so my one piece of advice here would be that if you do have a bunch of cartridges and they are kind of old and maybe not in the best shape, you might find yourself to be pretty disappointed when some of them don't actually work on the analog pocket. I did find that across the board, Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance games, for me at least, seem to run better. And it might be because those systems are much newer in the whole scope of things and so they're not as old of cartridges. Either way, something to keep in mind. Okay, two other quick notes I want to make. Number one here is that you will see a white indicator when the device is on, and if you plug it in, it will turn orange. That's how you know when it's charging. You'll also get a little battery indicator in the menu. And the other thing is that as soon as I had this on order, I went and I ordered some accessories for this thing just to kind of soup it up a little bit as well. So I bought these over from the Sakura Retro Modding Shop here. 
One is a stand and the other are some stickers for the back of the device. The stand itself is 3D printed and it's pretty easy to assemble, it's just three parts here. And I think of all the systems that I own, this is one of them that I would want to display the most, so it's kind of cool to have a little case like this. I think it cost about $15 altogether and it's totally worth it at least for me. It would be cool if you could also charge it while in the stand, but this is not made for that. Either way, that's what the case looks like. Now let's add one of those stickers to the back of the device here. And these are just little hologram stickers and he sent me a bunch of them. I guess he thought maybe I would mess them up, but altogether on my second try, I was able to get them installed nicely. And so if you are in the market for an analog pocket, I do recommend checking out his Etsy store because there's a pretty great selection of analog pocket accessories. There's 17 altogether right now. And I'm not getting paid for this or anything else like that. I just really like this store and I'm a big fan. Okay, so that's kind of it when it comes to running cartridges and how you can kind of get this device set up. But there's a lot more you can do with it, and that's what we're going to focus on in the next segment here. In fact, you can actually sideload Game Boy and Game Boy Color games into your SD card and then play them from there. And not only can you play, you know, your regular Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, but you can also do ROM hacks like this one here. And so I want to take a few minutes here to show you how to do that and also how to set up ROM hacks if that's something you're interested in. Now the key to all this is going to be this tool here, which is called the Retro Patcher. And this tool will actually use your original ROM files and then patch it into a pocket file. And then these pocket files are going to run in that GB Studio that we saw in the tools menu earlier in the video. Now not every game is going to be patchable. What you want to do here is go through the library and make sure your favorite game, like say for example Daffy Duck, is supported. You can also run it against the ROM MD5 checksum in case you want to make sure it's the exact same file that it needs. And so let's go ahead and do this with one example here. We'll do that Pokemon Prism that we saw here a second ago. And so first things first, I want to make sure that the Pokemon Prism game is actually supported. And if you go into the P section and then search for Prism, as you can see, yes, it is patchable within this tool. So let's go over to the Pokemon Prism subreddit and then check the pinned comment here. And within this, we'll have the link to the patch that you're going to need to use to patch the original game into Pokemon Prism. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this file here. I've already done it once before. That's why I'm replacing it. And then you want to use something like 7-Zip or WinRare to extract the file. And we only need one out of here, and that's the BSP file here. So let's go ahead and extract that one file here so that we have it within our game library. And then we can actually just delete that 7-Zip file. And so now what we want to do is go over to the official Pokemon Prism page. And within here is going to be a patch tool to make the original Pokemon Prism. What you're going to need is a Pokemon Crystal ROM and then that BSP file that we grabbed earlier. From there, all you have to do is press the Begin Patching button and then it'll give you three options here. What you want to grab is the Release ROM. So click on that, it'll say Patch Succeeded and then get the file. Now back on that Retro Patcher website, what we want to do here is select that button here and then grab our new Pokemon Prism Game Boy Color file. And just like that, it matched it with the patch and then you can just go ahead and save the file. And so yeah, there we go. We have a Pokemon Prism Pocket file, which will run on the analog pocket. So now let's do that with the rest of my Game Boy and Game Boy Color library that I have here in this folder. So I'm just going to select all of them but the Pokemon Prism one here. And as you can see, it shows all the different games that are found as well as the different patches that are available too. And not only that, if there are ROM hacks available for that ROM file, it'll show them here as well. For example, Tetris Rosie Retrospection, which I'll show here in a second. Either way, once you've imported your ROM files, you can go ahead and press this button here, which will allow you to save each of these pocket files individually. And so after you saved off all of these files, you should now have a new library with all of your different pocket files, which will now work in the analog pocket. Now, if you want, you can go in and clean up some of these file names, you know, taking out the region name or things like that. But either way, we're actually ready to add it to our analog pocket. What you want to do is grab a blank SD card. It doesn't matter what file format it's in. And then just go ahead and make a new folder here and call it GB space studio. And within that folder, just move over those pocket files. And you're actually good to go at this point. You can eject that micro SD card and put it in your analog pocket. Now, one thing I should note is that these patches that work for Retro Patcher are only going to be compatible with specific ROM files. That's when you need to check that MD5 checksum. A good example here is Super Mario Land 2. I had the revision 2 of this ROM and it didn't work at all. But when I used an original ROM file that wasn't a revision 2, I was able to not only grab that game, but then I was also able to get the DX version, which is going to colorize it. And then 
then also another one that has the DX version and then also some patches applied as well. And so my advice here is that if you do have a bunch of Game Boy or Game Boy Color ROMs and some of them aren't working in this tool, you may need to get a different ROM file that's either an older or a newer version. Either way, now let's take a look at the tool section and go into GB Studio and see what we have inside. And as you can see, all of my games have now been loaded up and I can just launch them directly from the micro SD card. But a couple things to kind of bear in mind. Number one is that the menu is kind of primitive looking. You can see how big the text is. It actually cuts off the name of the game. And on top of that, you can't press up to get to the bottom of the menu. You actually have to scroll down all the way up or down. Luckily, it scrolls pretty quickly. Either way, yeah, that's about it. You can just go ahead and select your games here and then launch right into them. And here is Pokemon Prism right here. Now, I haven't actually played this ROM hack, but I've heard a lot of great things and so if you have played it let me know what it's like in the comments below. Now one thing I do want to note is that you do have some limited functionality when it comes to these pocket files. For example you aren't going to be able to use save states but you will be able to go into the system settings and change things like the video options. And so if you want to change the colorization for Game Boy games things like that you are definitely able to do that. And also the sleep and wake function will work with pocket files too which is nice. And so personally, I think this is an ideal way to play Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. You can do things like play the original Super Mario Land 2 in all the DMG colorization glory, or you can pop in something like Super Mario Land DX and be able to play the colorized version of it too. And so I do think this is a pretty cool concept, the ability to be able to play all these games without swapping out the cartridges first, and the ability to apply some of the most popular patches. For example, the Link's Awakening Redux ROM will actually improve the audio and then change some of the scenes as well to make it just a little bit more user friendly. And probably one of my favorite ROM hacks is actually the Tetris Rosy Retrospection. This essentially will maintain the original Tetris game, but it'll also show you a little preview of your Tetromino here on the bottom of the screen. And you can press the select button to hold a piece at a time. And you can also press up to immediately drop your piece. And so to me, this is the best of both worlds. It has some of those new modern standardized controls to it, but it still has that classic beautiful Tetris look. Another ROM hack that I found really pleasant is the Metroid 2 Samus Return colorized version. I really love this game and to be able to see Samus in full color like this is pretty awesome. And of course that super pixel density just looks amazing as well. This is honestly the best I've ever seen any Game Boy or Game Boy Color game look. But you might be thinking, you know, we haven't talked about Game Boy Advance in a while, so let's get into the weeds about that one next. And luckily, the Analog Pocket actually supports EverDrive flash cards. Now, there's a couple you could use. For example, there is a Game Boy flash card, but honestly, the ability to sideload them through a micro SD card means you probably don't need to buy that one. However, the Game Boy Advance one might be something to look into. These run for about $100 when they are in stock, but often you have to get them on eBay eBay for upwards of $150 or even $200. Long story short with these is that they were originally developed in Ukraine and because of the Russian invasion they had to actually flee the country. And so now the company has resumed operations over in Western Europe but it has slowed down supply. And they also do sell some cheap knockoff flashcards as well that you can find on various places on the internet but I've never tested any of those so I can't really speak to those. But luckily I did order one of these EverDrive cartridges last year when I first ordered that analog pocket and so I've had this well before the Russian invasion. And so let's take a minute to show you how to set this up if you do happen to get your hands on one. First you want to go into the download section of their website and then go into EverDrive GBA and then OS. From there you want to download the most recent zip file and then once you have it on your computer all you want to do is extract it. And within that folder you're going to find one that's called GBA Sys. This is going to have the system hierarchy files that you're going to need to be able to run everything. Now the thing about this EverDrive is it also allows you to run emulators within the Game Boy Advance. And so if you look in the readme file, it'll show you which emulators are supported and how you need to rename them. Personally, I'm only really interested in the NES emulator, so that's the one I set up. And so all I did is I took a FAT32 formatted micro SD card, I threw that GBA sys folder inside as you can see it here, and then within that MU folder I added the NES Game Boy Advance emulator. And again I just followed that readme file that we have within this folder. And then finally all I did is I went into the root directory of my SD card, I made a folder for GBA and then NES. And within each of those I just added my ROM files. And as you can see here, here's my Game Boy Advance library, and then under NES here's my NES library. And so here's the flash card. I've added that micro SD card already and we are ready to rock. And so what's going to happen here is the analog pocket is basically going to think that this flash card here is just a typical regular Game Boy Advance cartridge. 
And so if we select play cartridge, it'll actually boot us into the file system of the SD card. So we can go into the Game Boy Advance folder and bam, here's my Game Boy Advance library. And so I can go ahead and cycle through here and then pick a game and then boot it right up. And so yeah, now I'm playing a Game Boy Advance game through a flash card and it looks just as good as the original cart did as well. Now, much like with those pocket files, you are gonna have some limited options here. For example, you're not gonna be able to use save states again, but you are gonna be able to go through and adjust some of those video settings too. But unfortunately, not all of them. For example, you can't adjust the size and dimensions of the picture itself. So if you wanted to move the Game Boy Advance picture to the very top or the very bottom of the screen, you wouldn't be able to do that. And unfortunately, one of my favorite things about this device, you can't use the sleep function with the cart either. And so for Game Boy Advance in particular, you're going to be limited to only in-game saves. They'll save it directly to the micro SD card, but you won't be able to do save states and you won't be able to sleep the device either. And so in essence, it's a lot like playing the original Game Boy Advance. You're not going to have some of those extra features, but the games do look really nice. So now let's move over to that NES emulator. And unfortunately, this is where things start to look pretty terrible. You have to remember here that this is actually emulating NES games within the Game Boy Advance environment. And so the resolution has been downgraded to the original Game Boy Advance resolution, so everything looks terrible. And on top of that, it actually can't play these games at full speed. The audio is the biggest giveaway. You're gonna hear lots of slowdown as well as stuttering. But even in games like Super Mario 3, when you get around several enemies at once, you'll actually experience actual slowdown as you're playing. And so if you're thinking of buying an EverDrive Game Boy Advance and you're hoping to play NES games on it as well, I would strongly recommend not relying on this for your NES gameplay. This is a $220 handheld that can play NES worse than most handhelds that cost maybe $30 or $40. Now there are some emulator settings you can access by pressing L and R and start and select, but even those are really limited. You actually can't do any sort of scaling that's gonna improve the picture in any tangible way. So overall, I would say that NES emulation on this is a bust. If you're gonna use an EverDrive flash cart, I would only use it for Game Boy Advance. Okay, I have a lot more things I wanna talk about with the analog pocket, but I think before we get into that, I wanna talk about what I like and don't like about the device first. As always, we're gonna start with the things that I like. And I would say number one here is that the device itself looks amazing. The analog pocket is something that just looks like it's meant to be displayed on a shelf somewhere. And on top of that, it has a very solid build quality to it. It actually feels really nice to hold in the hands. It feels really dense and well-made. The D-pad and buttons on this are excellent. I think that there are no complaints that I could really make about them. And there is definitely something to be said about the accuracy that comes with a field programmable gate array. Because this is mimicking the hardware environment when you're playing a game, you don't have to worry about things like whether or not it's gonna play at full speed or whatever. It's actually just gonna play like how it did on the original console, for better or for worse. Now the major plus for that is that the latency between the controls and everything else, it just feels really good and accurate. I honestly don't think I'm actually detecting any difference between the input latency, but it just feels very nice to play. And I think in particular when it comes to Game Boy and Game Boy Color, this thing is just phenomenal. The fact that it has that perfect aspect ratio and integer scaling really does mean a lot, especially if you're a huge Game Boy or Game Boy Color fan. I also think the ability to sideload Game Boy and Game Boy Color games does make make this a lot more enticing to me, especially when you're able to add things that you couldn't on an original system, things like ROM hacks. And if you do want to play Game Boy Advance games on here, it is compatible with an EverDrive so that you can load all the Game Boy Advance games on just a single cart. So essentially, you could put all your Game Boy and Game Boy Color games on an SD card and all your Game Boy Advance games on the cart, and you'd be able to access all three of those systems without ever having to swap a cart or a card or anything else like that. And to me, that's kind of an ideal setup. The only thing that would make it even better is if I could play more systems. And on that note, let's talk about some of the things I don't like about the analog pocket. Number one, I think there's no bones about it. The price versus the functionality on this is very poor. For around $250 shipped, you're only really going to be able to play three systems. And so it really comes down to whether or not you find that cycle accuracy to be very important to you. And it also comes down to how much you love Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance. Another thing I didn't like about the device is the shoulder button setup. When you put a cartridge in there, it's very hard to actually use the shoulder buttons. And the ironic part to that is the only time you're actually gonna need the shoulder buttons is when you have a cartridge inserted because there's no way to play Game Boy Advance without the cartridge inside. 
And so in that regard, I kind of consider it to be a self-defeating mechanism. I know a lot of people like the menu navigation of this device. It's very simple and easy to read, but all the same, I find it to be just kind of primitive and very beta feeling. I hope that at some point in the future, they're able to upgrade the firmware to give it a true kind of OS experience. Next, while I think that the aspect ratio works really well for Game Boy and Game Boy Color, it actually works out pretty poorly for every other system. Game Boy Advance is a great example. That's a 3 by 2 aspect ratio system, and when you try to play it on this device, you end up with really large letterboxing at the top and the bottom. And while over time my eyes kind of adjusted to that new setup, I never really got over the fact that the screen seemed a lot smaller in Game Boy Advance than I thought it should have been. And that really just comes down to the fact that they're squishing a 3 by 2 system into a 10 by 9 display. I also think one of the things that's hurting this device is that at this time there are no additional cores. I'd love to be able to play Nintendo or Super Nintendo on this device, but unfortunately it's just not possible right now. And I gotta say, I'm a little bit worried about what those 4x3 systems are going to look like when they're on a 10x9 aspect ratio display like this. It's also going to result in letterboxing, not as bad as Game Boy Advance, but it still might feel not that great. But either way, that's a moot point because we just don't have those cores available yet, and a lot of people thought they would be available by now, so it's Kind of a bummer. And then finally, my other gripe is that even though the Game Boy Studio and EverDrive solutions are great, they are also very limited. You're not going to be able to use things like save states, and you're also not going to be able to use the EverDrive with sleep function. And so while I appreciate having the ability to have those functions when you're playing a game, in a practical sense, if you're going to sideload your Game Boy games or use a flash cart, those features don't really matter anyway. And so just altogether, your experience ends up being a little bit more limited than it could be. And so yeah, that's a really quick summary of what I like and what I don't like about the Analog Pocket. I think at the end of the day, if you are a really big fan of Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, the ability to play your old cartridge games or to just sideload them via the Pocket Files patch is kind of a dream come true if you only want to stick to those systems. But honestly, I think the population of people who do want to stick to those systems already know about the Analog Pocket and they've probably already ordered I think for everybody else, you know, people who are not quite fixated on only Game Boy and Game Boy Color, you might be in search of other options, and I know I'm the kind of person that would be too. And so here are a few options that I would recommend checking out if you're in the market for a retro handheld and the analog pocket just seems a little bit too expensive for what it does. We'll start with the cheapest one first. This one is called the Miu Mini, and this is a $60 device and I've reviewed it extensively on this channel. Now this has a 2.8 inch screen, so it's a little bit smaller than the analog pocket, but the device itself is nice and compact. As you can see here, it's quite a bit smaller than the analog pocket itself. Now this device has a 4x3 aspect ratio, which means that when you do play things like Game Boy and Game Boy Color, you are going to have a little bit of pillar boxing, which is the black bars on the left and right. But as you can see, the color is nice and saturated on this device, and you can actually adjust the coloring within the settings menu as well. And it's definitely a smaller device, but all the same, it's a much more pocketable device as well. This is the device I grab when I'm just going to go out and run out into town and I just want to throw something in my pocket. And not only can this play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance, but it can play all the 8-bit and 16-bit systems, NES, Genesis, Super Nintendo, and it can even play most PlayStation games as well. And I gotta say, a small pocketable device like this playing Final Fantasy IX on the PlayStation 1 is just a sight to behold. And so if you're in a market for something that's small and pocketable and you want to play up to those systems, this is going to be a great option. Now if you're looking for something about the same size as the analog pocket, then I would recommend the Ambernic RG351V. Now this device is half the price of the analog pocket, it's $110, and it does have some distinctions about it. It's a little bit shorter than the analog pocket and a little bit wider as well. It also has a 3.5 inch screen, but this is a 4x3 aspect ratio, which means overall when it comes to screen real estate, you're actually going to have more screen here than on the pocket. And not only can this one play up to PS1 with some really good gameplay, but it can also play about half the catalog of the Nintendo DS, Dreamcast, Saturn, and PSP. And so if you're looking for a device that can play just a lot more systems at a budget price, this is a pretty good choice. Now of course this is software emulation, so it's not the same as an FPGA, but all the same, it has just enough power to the chipset that it can play all these systems pretty well anyway. And there's a lot of neat features that come with a software emulator like this. For example, within RetroArch you have Retro Achievements, which actually unlocks a lot of fun features with some of these older games. On top of that, you can do things like fast forward. This is going to be a really great option when you're trying to just kind of breeze through some Pokemon games or some other role-playing games. 
Now there are some concessions to be made. For example, the pillar boxing here also is represented because it's a 4x3 display. And honestly, the color saturation on this device is not quite as good as it is on the analog pocket. But the major strength in this just comes from the sheer amount of systems that are going to be supported by something like the 351B. You'll be able to play your games in a 4x3 aspect ratio, which means things like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Genesis, PS1, Dreamcast, even Nintendo 64 are going to run at a native aspect ratio. It's just going to look a lot better on this screen than I expected to look on the pocket. Now, like I kind of alluded to earlier, this is not the most powerful chip in the world. You're going to be able to play some Nintendo 64 and those other systems I mentioned, but not all of them. This device really shines with PS1 and below. And one last note to make is that 4x3 system will actually give you a little bit bigger of a screen when it comes to Game Boy Advance as well. Because 4x3 is a little bit wider than the 10x9, it means a 3x2 system is going to be a little bit larger. Now we're getting pretty far into the video, so it's time to do a cat break. And I haven't done one of these in a while. You know, my cat chicken has been a little bit sick lately, so she hasn't visited me that much. Either way, she's still around and she says hello to everyone. And so I hope you enjoyed this little cat break. And so finally, I want to talk about one last system that you should maybe consider if you are thinking about the analog pocket. And this one's actually the RG552. Now this device got a lot of flack when it first came out last year, and that was mostly due to its price at $225. But I gotta say, when it comes to retro gaming, this is still by far my favorite system to use. It has a 5.5 inch screen with a 5x3 aspect ratio and a nice high resolution as well. This makes it really well suited for a lot of different systems. On top of that, the D-pad and face buttons are just excellent on this, but it does have some shortcomings. For example, the shoulder buttons are a little bit hard to reach, especially when you're using an analog stick at the same time. And unfortunately, the battery life on this is not great. You're going to get about three hours of gaming time when it comes to retro systems, and only about two when you try to play some of those harder systems. But this device is quite a bit more powerful than the 351V that we saw earlier. What this means is that some of the systems that kind of struggle on the 351V are going to work pretty well. This device will dual boot into both Linux and Android, and between those two operating systems, you'll be able to play up through PSP, no problem. But the star of the show, to me, is playing retro games in this big, beautiful screen. Here's Game Boy Advance with a 3 by 2 aspect ratio, and as you can see, even with integer scaling, this just looks huge and amazing. I've tested almost 100 devices at this point, and by far this is my favorite one when it comes to retro systems. And not only do Game Boy Advance games look great, but all the 4x3 systems look good too. Here's the Super Nintendo with integer scaling on, and as you can see here there are some black bars on the left and the right, but they're not that bad. In fact, this fills up more of the screen than a lot of the more modern systems that use a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. But I would say the one system that doesn't look as good is going to actually be Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Because these have a more square aspect ratio, you're just going to have larger black bars on the left and right with these. Not the end of the world, but full disclosure here, this definitely doesn't have as good Game Boy as it does on the analog pocket. But of course, the RG552 can do a lot of things that the analog pocket cannot. In addition to the emulation that it can do on all those systems, the community has been hard at work at porting over native Linux games that can work on this device out of the box. And just over the past six months or so, we've seen a lot of games ported over which are really exciting. You can play things like Shovel Knight or Celeste or Stardew Valley, all with really good frame rates and that big beautiful screen. And most recently that Ninja Turtles game that came out just maybe a month ago or so, it actually runs natively on this as well. And so the way I see it, if you are going to spend something like $225 or $250 on a retro handheld system, between the two, I would actually pick the RG552. I get it that software emulation is not the same as FPGA, but all the same, all the systems that I can play on here, and with such good gameplay, with really great controls and a beautiful screen, to me it's just a no-brainer. And so at the end of the day, who do I think the Analog Pocket is for? Well, like I mentioned earlier in the video, I think that people who are huge fans of the Game Boy and Game Boy Color are going to enjoy it the most. If you have a large cartridge library, or you really just want to stick to Game Boy and Game Boy Color, I think you'll probably have the best experience. But I would say for everybody else, the distinction between FPGA and software emulation to me is not enough to justify that price tag. 
When I first got this thing, I was kind of hoping that it would change my mind about the analog pocket and I wouldn't see it as a very big expensive device. But unfortunately, it pains me to report that it actually didn't change my mind at all. It ended up being that I did definitely respect the device and I thought that it had some really great gameplay when it came to Game Boy and Game Boy Color. But in other regards, for example, playing Game Boy Advance games, I didn't find it as good as I thought it would be. And of course, the lack of ability to play other systems definitely makes this a price to perform ratio that I don't think is really worth it. But of course that's just my one opinion among many out there in the world and so I'm really interested to hear what you think about it in the comments below. Do you have an analog pocket and what do you think about it? Or have you been considering one or are you waiting on one coming in the mail and do you think it's going to be a good fit for your particular use case? Anyway that's about it for this very long video but I do hope you enjoyed it. As always thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming!